What is up, folks? It's the Emulsion Podcast, hosted by chef and media producer Justin Kana. That's me. The Emulsion is a result of my desire to educate, share, and personally keep myself up to date on stories stirring up the restaurant industry. I also sit down and interview remarkable professionals that are making exciting moves in their own unique and creative ways. Fine dining, chef swaps, new gear, critiques, professional performance, balance, hospitality, as well as the occasional rabbit hole are all just a few of the topics we get into here. But the goal, of course, being that you take off your headphones or get out of your car feeling smart smarter, more inspired, or more connected than when you pressed play. Where is the long ad read? You will not find that here because the growing gang of amazing folks on Patreon make it possible for me to hit the publish button every single Thursday, and I'm eternally grateful for their support. But more on that after the show. All right, all right, all right. In this episode of the Emulsion Podcast, we get into all the stories that I've piled up on my iPhone since the last solo episode. So you bet your you bet your knickers it's going to be a good one. So it's great to have you here. My name is Justin Kana, and welcome back. If it's been a minute since you've listened to this show, I've been on the road for a long time, and uh, I had the fallacy that I would be able to uh, continue to upload while I was on the road. But for some reason, I just feel a little bit more comfortable doing it back here in the studio. So that is what's happening. Let's get into some headlines. And yes, there are a lot of them on this episode. In a headline that I co- forgot to cover uh, in the last, last solo episode, uh, Denmark won the Boku's Door, <laughs> for anyone that's uh, in the competition arena. It was like a month ago, so it was a full Scandinavian sweep, as people have said, uh, with Sweden and Norway also on the podium. The U.S., which was helmed by chef Matt Kirkley and his Komi Mimi Chen, placed ninth place, which they didn't even medal because it, um, for whatever reason. It was a little bit disappointing considering the U.S. team won two years ago, albeit that was obviously with a different team. This was not the same team competing again. Um, so shout out to everybody that competed. You're braver than me. I, I, I don't have any experience in the competition sphere. Uh, But I'm totally stoked to see what happens for 2021 because um, if any of the rumors that I've heard are true, it's going to be a pretty fun uh, lineup to see the the chefs, at least from the U.S., that are going to be competing. Speaking of Scandinavia, the 2019 Michelin Guide for the Nordics have been announced right off the bat. My prediction did not happen. I put it out there on Twitter. Uh, I thought that Noma was going to get three stars right out of the gate. Noma got two stars. I Again, I predicted they would score three, but I am going to go on the record and reaffirm my prediction about three stars for next year based on the kind of trend that I've been seeing with Michelin being pretty good about giving outstanding restaurants two stars their first year open and then three stars the year after that that, um, just to kind of like give it that buffer to make sure that yes, indeed, this is worthy of three stars. Um, and they be, and, and the reason I say that is because they did it with grace. They did it with a uh, single thread in California. And yeah, I know that the Nordic guide is a little bit different than the U S guide, but, um, with Noma being in a new location with, you know, yes, a lot of the core team is still there, but they have, um, brought in a bunch of new people on their staff. There's a new menu structure with the way that they're, um, releasing tables and the way that they're doing their seasons now throughout the year. Noma is a different restaurant. So, um, that's part of the basis why I think that they will, um, go above and beyond and get the three stars next year. But I guess I will have to wrap my head around that idea that Noma is a different restaurant because in, in a lot of capacities, I think of Noma as Noma. And because Renee is still at the helm and they're still doing food that is around the same ethos that they've had for so long, I still consider it the same restaurant. Um, but as World's 50 Best has said, and as Michelin has said, it is a different restaurant. So that, that's exactly how they're going to treat it going forward. Um, Keeping on the Michelin Guide, quickie shout out to Gastrologic in Stockholm, Cokes in the Faroe Islands, and um, uh, uh, oh, uh, why did I delete that? There's one other restaurant that scored two stars. Maybe not. Um, But yeah, Gastrologic and Cokes, I think maybe were the only two restaurants that got two stars this year. Uh, There's um, Fagd in um, Trondheim, Credo in Trondheim, Alouette in Copenhagen, and Palace in Helsinki, all restaurants that have been awarded one star this year by the Michelin Guide. So um, I don't spend that much time in Scandinavia as I used to, but if there's anybody who's kind of like, I really want to go um, to Scandinavia to learn fine dining, or like, I think there's an opportunity for me to go abroad and get um, some skills, these restaurants have been recently awarded. So they're definitely really, really good places to check out. Um, it's also very, very sad to see Dill, the Icelandic restaurant of one star fame, lose its star this year. But that chef, at least from my research, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong here, the chef from Dill has been swapped. So Gunnar is now in New York City with Agern, and the chef at Dill is, uh, you'll have to excuse my Icelandic here, Kari Pjortinsson? 
ex- again, excuse my Icelandic, but it's a different chef at Dill, and I can only believe that that is one of the factors that contributed to um, um, Dill losing its star this year. That was the first Icelandic restaurant to earn a, t- a Michelin star with one star in 2017, and with the 2019 guide, it is now starless. Quickie shout out to my old sous chef at Per Se and mentor and friend, Daniel Calvert. The South China Post magazine did a whole piece on him and his love of the band of the Arctic Monkeys and relating that to defying expectations. So for anybody that doesn't know, Daniel Calvert um, was, again, my old sous chef at Per Se. Um, He was kind of like who I modeled myself after. He was a sous chef at Per Se at 23, and I told myself that I wanted to be a sous chef uh, at 23, and I did it um, like a month before my 24th birthday, uh, in Norway. So it was like just in time I slid in and, and, and I was able to become like satisfy that, um, goal of mine. But, um, yeah, he would just be, he was just super gracious to me. I was an extern and he was a young sous chef and I would just like stay after and help him on all these projects. And now he is uh, running his own restaurant in Hong Kong, which is incredible. And so to quote the article here, quote, it's a sign of a great artist. You have to remember this as a chef. It would be easy for me to do Wagyu and put caviar on everything, but it would be too easy. I used to do a pigeon dish in pastry that people would always say they didn't want. And then they tried it and realized that they did want it. Now I've taken it off the menu and it sells more than when it was on it, end quote. And of course, as I've said before, Danny is just killing it. He got his first Michelin star in December. I know that he's certainly been through the ringer with that restaurant, and I wanted to take a second on here to show him and give him so much deserved love, and it got me wanting to head to Hong Kong to like sit down with him in the in the restaurant and get him on the podcast. Also, shout out to everyone that's seen my Hong Kong vlog from all those years ago when John and I went to go eat there and, of course, visit Danny. Uh, As I typically do every year, I'm giving you a heads up that James Beard Foundation has released its semi-finalists for their annual awards. It's far too long for me to dive into here. It's just kind of like a list of, um, again, it's a list of semi-finalists. But I've got it linked up in the show notes for you to peruse at your leisure, and we will 100% cover it again once the winners of the 2019 James Beard Awards are announced. Uh, one bit I did want to cover though is this account on Twitter that I've been following for ages. It's the Restaurant Manifesto. It's at RestoFesto, I think, on Twitter. And they posted this tweet that kind of like got me, it got my head kind of turning a little bit. And it goes, Quote, looking over the list of James Beard semifinalists and thinking about how so many unnamed chef de cuisines bust their asses every day so that figurehead chefs can get all the recognition, end quote. And I thought that was a very, very interesting point. And the reason that I wanted to cover this is because it's a very toxic mentality, at least from my perspective. And I can say that because I used to think that way. I used to have the mindset that, yo, this is bullshit. I spend 12 hours a day on the line cooking the main dishes on the tasting menu. I do so much of the plating. It's my mise en place that's being served out there. It sucks that chef takes all the credit when the awards come around. I used to be like that. And that's very, very, it's very selfish. It's a very entitled way to think because listen, yes, if a restaurant is getting recognized for the food, you're absolutely right that you should be part of the congratulations if you prepare the food. But We've seen it before with Thomas Keller highlighting his chef de cuisines at Per Se and French Laundry respectively at awards like World's 50 Best. When he gets on stage, his chef de cuisines photo is right there next to his on the big screen, right? And we've seen chefs like Christian Puglisi acknowledging his entire staff when there's an award. He says it's not about me. He says it's it's all about my my team, right? And even my chef that I was working for when I was on the hotline um, in Norway would always admit that I, it was me who was cooking all the fish and the meat when the film crews would come by. He would be like, uh, it's Justin over there whose fingers are way better at uh, touching the grill than I am. I just have like uh, head chef fingers or whatever he would call them. Um, but there's two very important things that I've learned now being on both sides of the equation, right? And it's this, the press, the guests, the people who are giving you these awards, they know you have a team, right? They don't think you're in the kitchen doing it all by yourself. They know that you have a team behind you. The thing is, oftentimes, they don't always care, right? They want you. They want the person behind the project. They want the director of the film to kind of equate it to something else. They they want the conductor of the orchestra. They want the coach of the Super Bowl winning football team, right? Like, yes, the tight end probably made a great play during the game, and they had some really great stats all season, but they want to talk to the coach because that's what gets headlines, and that's what people remember. That's what makes money, and that's what sells things. And so that's something that I, it really took my, me a long time to wrap my head around that when yes, it is oftentimes a team effort, but that's, 
people people can't sit the entire team in a in a in a studio and record an interview, right? That would be very unproductive. They want the one per like who should we talk to? Who is who is running this whole thing? And oftentimes that's a chef and they're doing things that are other than cooking. They're not pouring the wine. And that it took me a long time to wrap my head around that. So the other thing that I've learned is that there are a lot of people who get so comfortable in the kind of whining and complaining arena. And I'm not trying to trigger anyone here, but the question becomes, if you're so good, why don't you go do your own thing? And that's something that I asked myself. Like, that's what where I got to when I got these frustrations in, in my bones. I was, like, so frustrated of, like, chef's never here, this is so bullshit. And then I went off and I did my own thing, and I was like, whoa, right? So my job as an executive sous chef in Norway was a walk in the frickin' park compared to doing my own dinners on my own now, right? Like, back in Norway, I had a boss, and I could point fingers at that boss. And I had the repu- like I had the reputation of a restaurant that I could use to negotiate things, right? I could call up, and I could say, hey, this is Justin from Lease Verket calling, right? And all the press that my chef was getting ultimately helped bring guests in so I could focus on the, the the food and the kitchen team, right? It was amazing. And it's easy to get caught up in the ego trap of thinking that your work isn't being recognized, right? You work really hard. But, but, but in reality, your work is a result of the organization of being set up in a way to help you succeed. Does that make sense? Like, your work exists because your chef has a job opportunity for you. Does that make sense? And if 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 your chef that just got nominated for a James Beard Award can leave the restaurant to go cook in Chicago or L.A. and the place can still serve guests, they're killing it. And you're just too head down to see it. And that's something that I probably needed to hear a couple of years ago. So I know that it, sometimes it takes you to go to the other side to realize some of these things. But if maybe this just connects with one person, I think that that um, totally is, is worth it. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to continue that a little bit in saying that the, the, the people that are getting these awards, the people that are getting nominated, they have created a functioning, consistent business that makes money while they sleep essentially. And that's why they're nominated for an award, not because their lamb neck dish is bomb, right? Am, 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 am I making sense now with some of this stuff? It t- Again, it took me a long time to wrap my head around this, and I'm sorry that this has turned into something more than a headline. Uh, I just had to kind of take a second and snap over that tweet, uh, I guess, because it it, it it hurts sometimes to to hear that and to see that and to, to know that there's people out there that see a James Beard nomination and get salty about it when it should be about a little bit of recognition and a little bit of uh, acknowledgement for the hard work that gets done. So my hope for you, and maybe you'll use this as a takeaway, there's a time to be a technician, there's a time to be a manager, and there's a time to be an entrepreneur. And if you can have the self-awareness to see where you're at in your journey, you can then have the humility to give credit where credit is due and be patient enough to wait for your time to come. Because as I've said before with my content, if you chase towards the awards and the accolades, you're only going to end up disappointed. So with, with that, shout out to all the nominees. I love seeing who's killing it out there in the U.S. food scene. So I promised I would give, uh, keep you folks up to date on Yugen, who is, uh, that's uh, Mari Katsumura's place in Chicago that took over Grace's old shell after it closed in 2017. And Eater put out a piece detailing what's happening with Yugen now that it's up and running. So nothing particularly striking caught my eye from the piece. Um, she's definitely taking her own interpretation of Japanese fine dining. She's using a lot of great local product. She's working her face off, clearly. She's finding her own voice. She's managing her staff with a little bit less military pretense. That was something that stood out to me from the article. Um, And she's trying to breathe new life into the space um, and kind of planting her own flag in Chicago. Uh, What I did think was funny, though, is that they kept the $1,000 plus chairs in the dining room, which to me is like a very uh, signifying factor that like this is Grace's dining room. Which, fun fact for anybody who doesn't know, those $1,000 plus chairs are made out of the same leather that they use in Bentleys. So it's kind of understandable that they kept those around because I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's like 30 or 40 something of those chairs. And that would be a very, very uh, expensive thing to uh, throw away. And who's going to buy all those? That's, 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 I guess, my question. Uh, I'm still kind of sad that I didn't make it to Chicago on my road trip. We had to like divert our, our route. And so I didn't get a chance to do any of the Chicago interviews that I wanted to do, but it's still on my list to have Mari on the show. So one, we can catch up and two, I can ask her some more questions about the project because, um, if you've been wondering what's up with, uh, you again, um, I am too. And I want to know from her perspective. So, um, w- basically all that we have right now is the article that, um, Eater put out just now. So if you want to check that out, that's of course available in the show notes. 
I need to get someone uh, that grabs sound bites for me because Joshua Skeens is back in the news and it's not that far off from what I predicted uh, would happen. So he posted on his website in the quote unquote news section all about where he's at, like in life and professionally. And I thought I would read you a bit of it because it's 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 interesting. So, quote, 10 years ago, my team and I opened up a pop-up in a drafty old carriage house in the back of an alley. We served dinner once a week. We had no real stove, no not even indoor heating. I dug a fire pit in the backyard, and we built that leap of faith into Saison, an expanding company. We've been fortunate enough to have achieved tremendous success, but as proud as I am of everything we've accomplished and deeply grateful to all those who have contributed, evolution has been long overdue, and unfulfilled potential has haunted my dreams. Six years ago, ironically, a very short period of time after I opened Saison in its second location. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. Saison had an original location and then they uh, changed locations. Okay, back to Josh. Quote, I knew that the space would not be able to sustain the vision that I had in mind. Since that time, I've been largely out of the kitchen and working on another project behind closed doors. With ma- any major shift comes an opportunity for change, which is why I've asked my friend Laurent Gras to carry Saison into its next chapter with his own creative vision while I remain an owner and partner. I think this might have been uh, some news that we uh, have read over the, uh, in the past. So, quote, we have worked diligently over the past, over the years, to engineer a self-reliant food and beverage production system, one that provides both equilibrium and biological footprint ultimately meaning we leave the land better than we found it and simultaneously providing the highest quality and taste that can possibly exist in our region finally today we are in direct control of every element that reaches the plate at least surrounded by its source skeens ranch is a working farm ranch and farm a quote-unquote restaurant a lab a school a forum for innovators and collaborators improving how we grow and raise food and hopefully a model that reminds us to look at food as vitality as nature intended and to try and shrink our circle of consumption it's a place that can that constantly reminds you to breathe deeply and live life to its fullest, end quote. He then goes on to talk about a few things that the ranch is currently offering, from private dinners to fly fishing excursions, hosted travel to foraging and grilling masterclasses. But overall, this is 100% what I had in mind when I heard the news all those months ago about Laurent Gras taking over Saison. Joshua Skeens is an incredibly talented chef, and he has no reason to uh, completely exit Saison, which is why I'm super happy to hear that he's still an owner and a partner. I'm also super happy to hear that he's got the self-awareness to see that, you know, damn, I'm not happy being at the helm of a three-star spot in downtown San Francisco. I want to do this. I just want to do it outside in the middle of nowhere. And as a matter of fact, I want to go even deeper and explore what this avenue has to offer. And I say mazel tov to him. That's incredible to know that that's what you want to do and to have the resources available to explore that. So What's going to be interesting, at least for me watching from the outside, is to see how Angler works. And after having an incredible meal there, yes, there will be a This Place Called episode about my meal at Angler. And also seeing that what they have plans uh, for as far as Angler LA. And they also recently announced uh, Angler Seattle. Yes, this is a headline inside of a headline. I'm curious to see what Skeens' role will be in the Angler projects. Because based on what I've experienced with meals at Cezanne and now at Angler, Angler is essentially a all carte saison regardless of if he calls it an a la carte option so if laurent gras is controlling the creative direction of saison will that affect the ang the the aesthetic and the food of angler will will it just affect the one in san francisco will the la one have a different food compared to the seattle one based on the chef um, how much of a stake does Skeens have in angler if angler is technically underneath the saison parent company I'm not in the know enough to have all the answers, but I'm going to continue to keep my eyes on the brand because love or hate Josh Skeens, he's a different breed of chef, and I'm very, very intrigued to see what happens next. And that is actually not all I have about Josh Skeens. The news broke about a scandal with him and Barbara Shi, who is an investor in Saison, and the story basically goes like this. So, Barbara wrote Cezanne a check in 2013 for $300,000 and basically said, pay it back in a year with some interest, please. Then, quote, Cezanne did not repay the note, instead producing a new one for $315,000 to include accrued interest. This allegedly reoccurring annual, this, this allegedly reoccurred annually until the plaintiff demanded payment in 2016, at which time the note with interest had reached three hundred and ninety four thousand five hundred and twenty six dollars and seventy one cents. So uh, almost increasing by thirty three percent, basically that 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 uh, loan. So 
The reason, and the reason why he didn't repay this whole entire thing almost three years later, is a little bit shocking. So the article says, quote, Among other claims, the plaintiff alleges that Saison Dining and Saison Group's funds were, were, quote, used to pay for and maintain Skeens' personal lifestyle, including but not limited to paying his personal credit card debt, funding his extravagant wedding in Japan, and funding his and his family's personal travel. End quote. And basically, she's taking them on in court to pay the initial amount plus interest plus any legal fees, which is completely understandable, right? If you write someone a check and they don't give you your money, you're entitled to your money back. But what's crazy is the fact that Saison isn't apologizing or trying to keep this under the rug. They're like denying the entire thing. And this is a statement from the restaurant. It reads, quote, This most recently filed lawsuit is a breach of contract claim against a separate and independently owned company, which is not connected to Saison Restaurant. Still, this suit shamefully attempts to smear our good name solely for publicity reasons in a frivolous matter which is completely without merit. Our attorneys are still evaluating the many bogus claims contained in this suit, which we plan to vigorously defend in court, including pursuing cross claims against the plaintiff for its defamatory actions. End quote. And the craziest part about this whole thing is that you can read the whole complaint in the Eater piece. Like, it's all public knowledge. And I have that linked up in the show notes if you're <clears throat> a legal buff and you want to get into that. But I'm not attempting to say that I know anything about Josh Skeens' personal life, and I've never met this Barbara lady. But I do have a weirdly specific angle on this, and that's the fact that John and I, actually, when we were going to San Francisco, our initial reservation at Angler was for four people. And two of those people backed out because they knew Barbara, and they knew the story, and they didn't want to support any of Cezanne's businesses. So... That makes me think that this isn't a hoax, and Cezanne is, you know, like, take that for what it's worth, right? Basically, that seems to me that this isn't a fake thing. They're just trying to keep it as low profile as possible by denying it so that it doesn't blow up, at least as from my perspective. If any of you folks know exactly what's going on with this whole Cezanne fiasco, please let me know. And I get it, right? The amount of money just teleporting around in the Bay Area for projects rivals certain countries' GDPs, right? So the kinds of people that Josh was probably hanging out with wanted to see certain things, whether it's a fat whip or a new watch or even new equipment um, in his kitchen. And I'm not going to judge, right? But as with most of these horror stories, I want them to be on your radar so that when you get a $300,000 check written to you, you will be a little bit careful before you plan a trip to the Maldives with your family. Just saying. In a news story about my alma mater, the Poughkeepsie Journal published a piece called, quote, A Fine Line Premieres March 1st at CIA, Turn Spotlight on Women in the Culinary World, end quote. So the gist is, there's this woman named Valerie James, and her daughter, Joanna James, made a vi- is it Joanna? Yes. I thought I, I was, conf- I don't, I don't, I didn't want to confuse it with Johanna. So it is Joanna, at least from my, uh, my typing here. And Joanna made a film all about women in restaurants and it's currently doing the, f- the festival film circuit. And it highlights chefs like Lydia Bastianich, Kat Cora, who yes, we will talk about later and April Bloomfield. So based on when this, this, uh, show is being recorded, which is, uh, March 4th, the premiere has already happened. So if you're a CIA student and you saw this movie, Again, it's called A Fine Line, uh, and you know exactly what happens. Sound off in the comments or tweet at me and let me know how it was because um, I'm covering it here on the show, and I'd love to know what you thought about the movie. So what I thought was really interesting to me just reading this press piece were a few lines in particular. Quote, the film had been almost four years in the making and playing the festival circuit, but then the Me Too movement happened, and I felt it was not right to not address it. End quote. So the article says she made a costly and time consuming move to edit and recut the film to address the challenges women face in the culinary field. End quote. And so now I'm even more curious to see how this movie is positioned. And I'd actually love to see the initial edit of the film and then compare that to the new edit. Because on one hand, it would be amazing to see what the film looked like before the influence of the Me Too movement. Was it more storytelling and more about her mom? Because on the other hand, she couldn't, she could have been too afraid to address the issues because she felt it would have, you know, made made it a different movie before some of these stories came out. So I'm genuinely curious. Um, I'm super keen on the messaging that they're pushing. James saying, quote, I really think it's about men and women having important conversations, not only professional, but at home to create opportunities for advancement, 
end quote. And the last thing on this, just do a bit of fact checking um, because some of the reporting in this piece is a little bit misleading. The author of the article says, quote, her research reveals that less than 7% of head chefs and restaurant owners are women, despite women having traditionally held a main role in the kitchen. And with women comprising slightly more than half of the student population at the CIA over the past few years, a premier culinary school founded by two women with a vision that dates back to 1946, end quote. So I did a little bit of fact checking on a couple of those numbers. Uh, first of all, the NRA states that more than half of the restaurants in the U.S. have women as full owners or co-owners, with women as 45% of a restaurant's managers. And on top of that, it says that 19% of chef positions are female. So I'm curious to hear where that 7% statistic came from. And number two, yes, women did, quote, hold the main role in the kitchen, but that a lot of that has to do with the home kitchen, right? And that's based on the education and employment opportunities that were available to women at the time, that, which is definitely something that we've clearly moved on from. Um, so number three, yes, I believe that half the student population at the CIA is female. I'm not denying that fact, but they fail to mention the fact that at CIA, there's culinary and there's pastry, right? And those ratios are like 70, 30, or even even 80-20, at least when I graduated, where, like, take for culinary, for example, there are typically more males in culinary classes than females. And then in pastry, the ratio flips, right? There are typically more females in pastry classes than males. And when that's all tallied together, yes, it's closer to 50-50, but I thought that should have been said because it, it definitely dictates what happens after people graduate, right? Because, say, if 30% of the graduating culinary class is female and 19% of the chef workforce is female, that's not that weird of a stat, right? But then if you say that 50% of the graduating staff is class is female, but then only 7% of the workforce is female, then that's kind of like what happened, right? And I might be totally wrong. NRA's facts, the NRA National Restaurant Association's facts might be wrong, or it might be from a weird data set, like what cities did they pull from? But I think it's really important to make sure that we're talking about apples and apples, not apples and oranges, especially when we're um, kind of trying to champion uh, certain prerogatives, if that makes sense. Are you still with me? Three more headlines, I promise, and then we'll get into it. I I, uh, I I shouldn't be apologizing. Maybe you're enjoying these bite-sized stories. Okay, moving on. A company in Seattle called Atomos has launched a Kickstarter for their molecular coffee, and it's super bizarre. I don't know exactly how to explain what it is. I did some digging and was basically able to gather. The gist is they use an insoluble material to stimulate the grounds in coffee. Does that make sense? And then they infuse those insolu insoluble materials with certain compounds to give it the flavor of coffee. So, quote, for the insoluble, non-volatile portion of the molecular grounds, we're still exploring many options and targeting an upcycled play that would take the byproduct of a current commercial operation and add value to it by using it as the carrier matrix for our flavor and mouthfeel compounds. Essentially, the proteins, carbohydrates, and oil compounds you can expect from coffee grounds. Some examples of that would be watermelon seeds or sunflower seed husks. So picture that. They're taking uh, sunflowers. The, there's a sunflower seed plant. They make peeled sunflower seeds. They have all these husks, and they don't know what to do with them. So Atomos takes those, mixes them to be the consistency of coffee grounds, and infuses them with, what do they call it, um, proteins, carbohydrates, and oil components that traditionally go into coffee, and then that is what you use to make your coffee. That makes sense? In, in, in the same way that you would buy vanilla extract, where it's like technically just the alcohol or... Um, um, what, 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 am, what am I thinking of? The, the compounds used to make vanillin, um, and that is distilled into alcohol, and that's basically what your little bottle of vanilla extract is. It's not always vanilla. Um, this is the same thing where it's not technically coffee. It's just all the things that make something taste like coffee um, infused into something that you can then steep like coffee and then drink like coffee. So they're partnering with a larger packaged food company here to take this to the next level. They've got experience with companies like Soylent and McDonald's. So this is one of those incredibly researched and funded food science projects that ultimately has the goal of helping out the coffee farmers that are getting more and more pressure on them to produce. It's very similar to the lab-grown meat issue that we've talked about here before. Um, I don't think that a project like this will eliminate the original 
But if they do, they do actually do a cool taste test in their Kickstarter video at the University of Washington on their coffee versus Starbucks. And whether it's rigged or not, it wins by quite a bit. So I would, I'll definitely be sure to keep my eye out if I see this at a cafe or if I see them um, open up any sort of store here in Seattle. They are Seattle based. Um, I would love to drink it and as use it as today's beverage or even like use, I, I normally have two to three cups of coffee a day. And so to have like one cup be original and then have the other cup be something else. Uh, I mean, I'm already doing that. I drink, I usually drink mushroom coffee as my second um, cup of coffee for the day. And you know, I, I would actually love to get one of the founders on the podcast and chat about that because I actually did a stint with a packaged food company last year and I am still on call with them to do some R&D. So it's an arena. I think it's fascinating. Packaged food, all the food science stuff that happens is really, really fascinating. And of course, as an avid coffee drinker, this story definitely caught my eye. Molecular coffee. What does everybody think of molecular coffee? It's very interesting. Um, Ever since El Bulli closed back in 2011, that was essentially right when I was beginning my real culinary journey, I've been waiting to see what Ferran would do, and they just dropped the news that the El Bulli Foundation is going to begin their work in February of 2020, so a year from last month. They will, in 11 months, they're going to start their work. So no, they will apparently not serve food, but the organization named El Bulli 1846 will be staffed by a team of around 20 professionals with different backgrounds, including philosophers, cooks, journalists, and nutritionists, who will all be task with exploring new culinary techniques, and I could not be more excited about this. I was literally just talking with someone the other day about the fact that we've gone a few years without any intensely experimental modernist cuisine in the mainstream. And so what I've noticed is, like, there's a value, I think, in cherry-picking the really thoughtful or fun techniques that came from that era and infusing them into your food, and it can be a really interesting way to blow people's minds in 2019, because what we essentially have, and I'm guilty of this too, is this culture of fine dining around uh, wood fire, around cooking with vegetables, and basically doing both of those things plus luxury ingredients, right? W truffles, caviar, uh, foie gras right? And most of that also has a focus on French and Japanese frames of reference. We've talked about that on the show before. And so I think that's really fascinating that El Bouilly was not that. El Bouilly was kind of like trying to get away from old school French. It was trying to not be Japanese. But I'm really excited to see what the work that they produce is and what it what what it does and 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 how it ripples outwards and how it's going to benefit all of us in our creativity because that's what Ferran is supposedly all about. Also, side note, I'm 100% committed that if Ferran decides to do a creativity-focused meal, like if he's actually going to flex on people and do a meal, I will pull all the strings that I have to do to be at that meal because it's one of my biggest regrets that I never got a chance to eat at El, El Bui, and I would love to attend something that he creates, um, so I'm just putting that on the record. If anybody sees anything related to El Bui doing a dinner, buy a ticket and I will reimburse you, I promise, or you can come with me. I don't really care. Um, I just really want to go eat Ferran's food because um, he's not going to be around forever, and I know that. Okay, last headline, I promise. Phil Vitell reviewed Next, who has a new chef de cuisine. Edgar um, Tinoco helms the kitchen these days, replacing Jenner Tomasca. And this is his first menu um, where he's bearing all of the weight. It's called Silk and Spice. We covered this when they announced the menus for the upcoming season. And long story short, he gave it three out of four stars. So nothing crazy bad to say. If you want to read the full review and see the food, please do. I definitely think they're doing a lot of really fun food, especially on the um, Indian spectrum, which I was, of course, excited to see. But um, Phil Vitell's explanation of why he gave it three out of four stars was, quote, enough dishes lack that trans transcendent quality, which his kitchen so often delivers to rank Silk and Spice among Next's finest efforts, end quote. So three out of four stars it is. All right, all right, all right. Whew, we did it. Everybody take a deep breath. That was a lot of headlines. As it goes, we had a lot to get caught up on. I want to take a few minutes here to thank the newest amazing folks on Patreon for their support. It's been a little while, but we actually had a lot of people um, pledge their support. So we have Nick S., Zena O., Jose D., Andrew L., Michael T., Alex H., Calvin H., or Calvin T., why did I say Calvin? Calvin H. Calvin Harris. Calvin Harris supports me on Patreon. No, Calvin T is better than Calvin H because Calvin T supports me on Patreon. Wowzers, you folks are amazing. If you want to see how you can support the show for just $1 per month, please head over to patreon.com slash Justin Kana. I actually have this weird glitch. Um, 
over the past month where a few people's pledges have been declined on my Patreon account. So it's technically operating under capacity and it has been for a few weeks now. So I went ahead and I actually opened up five more slots on the mentor tier until Patreon gets back to my tech support ticket. So there are technically 15 spots now available on the mentor tier. So if a couple more people want to join, that's available. And I look forward to scheduling some coaching calls. And I plan on going, um, picking up a few things for uh, next quarter's gearbox from Japan when I'm go to Japan. So there will be some fun Japanese stuff in uh, the next Gearbox. So if you want to join that party, that is a $50 a month um, tier. You get monthly coaching check-ins with me those last 30 minutes. And we do it every single month. So we kind of uh, crack out your goals. We decide what they're going to be. And I essentially, I'm, I'm, I'm your accountability buddy. I give you some advice uh, based on what you tell me that your ambitions are. And then we try to check in and basically make sure that you're still on the right track to reach those goals. So I'm also um, working on a coaching program where you can get multiple calls at a more affordable price because a couple of people have reached out. They say they want to do a coaching thing. They say, oh, that's a little bit too expensive for me. I want to make it so that we can have a longer lasting relationship because that's essentially more worth my time as well because then I can continue to see you through a transition or see you progress a little bit past your just a one hour call and a little bit of advice. So stay tuned um, for that. I'm working on exactly dialing down how that's going to work and if I'm going to do it inside of Patreon, outside of Patreon, stay tuned. So today's beverage, this has been sitting here forever and I've been dying to crack it open. Um, This is a LaCroix Curate, which is their kind of like flavor combos that they'll do. Um, Anna got a bunch of these the other day and I'm very, very excited to say that I really like this flavor. This is a Pina Freis, Freis, it's a uh, pineapple strawberry flavor and based on all the pineapple I ate in Hawaii, this brings me back. And that was a lot of talking. Ooh, so feels great to get um, a little bit of that in my system. Let's get back to the main stories here. So I absolutely have to start with Soleil Ho, San Francisco's new, San Francisco Chronicle's new restaurant critic. And of course, she replaced Michael Bauer, but how is she doing in her new position? And I said it in my initial uh, impressions of the news of her uh, joining that role that I think she's got some spunk to her. She's been hosting a podcast for a while. She's very active on Twitter as opposed to what I said. So she's definitely down with the cool kids as far as new media goes. And she dropped a bombshell the other day to kind of present her portfolio on their site. And it was in the form of five articles being released at the same time. So there's a reason that we haven't heard that much from her because she's been hard at work. And what that's effectively does, her releasing five articles at once does, is it makes sure that when you go to the Chronicle's food section or the restaurant section, it's now densely populated with stuff. So you have a bunch of Salejo's stuff to read. So Meanwhile, and this is pretty crazy, there was also news of her rules to reviewing restaurants. So she did both at the same time. And so I'm going to dedicate a bit of this show to kind of dissect some of um, what Salejo has been working on and what that means for the San Francisco food scene. So let's get right into that. So right off the bat, um, most of you might have seen it. She is eliminating stars, and that has been one of um, the pieces of news that has garnered the most attention. So every single review that she produces will be starless. You won't find a witty quip at the end, and then the price, and then the address, and then two out of four stars, or four out of four stars, right? She's just doing away with the practice altogether, which is something that we've seen with critics like Jonathan Gold in the past. And I think it's incredible how transparent she's been with the whole process, saying on the, the Chronicle's website, quote, When I review restaurants, I'm talking about their context, how they exist in the world. I want to describe the images and feelings restaurateurs and chefs produce in with me, the choices they make with their menus, architecture, marketing, music, to share the experiences I've had in restaurants with you in fresh and interesting ways. I think my qualitative assessment of a place is much more valuable than a quantitative one. If I used a star system, a playlist featuring lots of tracks by the police would probably merit two stars, while one heavy on the Rihanna would receive five. Makes sense to me, but it's certainly not fair." End quote. And overall, she's got a much more daunting job with the... Um, She's got a much more daunting job, right? Well, while while my flavor and execution video still technically applies here, she's talking about atmosphere and music and the wine list and always into what she writes about as opposed to, you know, my little this place called videos. But it's absolutely one of the reasons why I've stayed away from star rankings in those as well because 
I said it in my flavor and execution video. I think that a taco place can be just as prolific as Californios in San Francisco, which has two Michelin stars. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I also think that it prevents such a dramatic reaction. I think there's been so many times when we've seen critics from the New York Times or, of course, Michelin or even like Bauer back when he was um, the critic of the San Francisco Chronicle. They drop a review and people kind of glance at the headline and that's what they kind of talk about. Um, they don't talk about any of the details. They don't talk about the actual writing. They just talk about like, oh, that place got two stars. But in reality, it only had a few things wrong with it that prevented it from getting three stars. And, you know, like if you're a consumer, what if those few things that were wrong with it had to do with the wine service and you as a guest don't happen to drink wine? Well, that probably means that you're going to have a three star experience, right? But then the question becomes, what the fuck is a three star experience? So I think... That being a little bit more articulate, going a little bit more in depth, will kind of nip the headline reading in the bud and allow for more of a conversation, which also helps draw attention to the fact that going out to eat at a restaurant is such a subjective experience, and she's very transparent with that, which I'm, a, of course, a big fan of. And I realize that I haven't posed a question for you yet here in this show. What do you think about this move away from um, stars at the end of a review? Is it helpful? Is it hurtful? Do you think it's silly? Please let me know in the comments or tweet at me or if I'm just in your ears, um, to say, hey, let me know your thoughts. And hey, just because I interject random questions in the show doesn't mean I don't want you to sound off on whatever resonates with you that I'm talking about on this show. I'm all about the conversation. So let's start one up. Next up from Soleil, we've got her list of words that she refuses to use in her writing. This is back to some of the rules that she uh, described for herself, and I think it's actually brilliant. So the whole piece is linked up down below, but I'm going to read a few of these no-no words here for you, and you can kind of take them for what you think they're worth. Uh, crack, describing something like it's crack. Uh, addictive, guilt, ethnic, slutty, authentic, Kafir Lime, which you might be wondering why not use the word Kafir Lime, she says, quote, the Chronicle style guide suggests makrut or magrut in place of Kafir when referring to citrus hystrix. The, the trouble comes from the fact that the word is a cognate for a slur used by white colonists to refer to black Africans in South America, end quote. I didn't know that. Um, phrases as well that she's trying to stay away from, the next big the new, uh, man food, girly drinks, cheap eats, and of course the phrase up and coming neighborhood. Aside from the rant that I've gone on before about putting creative constraints in place, I think this is immensely valuable for a writer to do. She's gone ahead and taken a look at these often inflammatory words or phrases that people will use to kind of get a rise out of people or to hyperbolize something, and she's just kind of keeping them off limits for herself, and I totally, totally get it. Um, I actually thought of doing something similar for my own menus, uh, essentially taking the kind of crutches or the blatantly copied uh, ideas or flavor combinations that I find myself constantly reaching for and starting off a year with basically I will not use these on a menu for 2019. So think of things like goat cheese and beets or duck and orange or carrot and miso, right? Like these combos that I don't think anyone is arguing is delicious or not, but it feels like such a cop out when someone compliments you on your food like, Oh, those carrots are so good. And it's like, thank you. You know, it's it's like just a hollow sense of satisfaction because you knew it was going to work. You knew that carrots and miso was going to be delicious. And you didn't essentially do anything creative. And you essentially just did something that's proven to make people feel a certain way. And hopefully that was a good tie-in for those of you who that don't read or uh, read that San Francisco Chronicle or those of you that don't write anything. I just think that's an um, interesting thing that us chefs can think about. Like, what things will we not touch as chefs? I think that can be kind of interesting to think about. So, back to Soleil. As to why she's removing these words, she's got this fun little explanation. Quote, some might call this self-censorship or being too politically correct, but as a writer, I think pretending that word choice doesn't matter would undermine my whole profession. Moreover, if caring about other people means I have to find a better and more creative word than addictive to describe how good a bag of chips is, I'm fine with that small inconvenience of that. End quote. So, Next up, she published a piece about being anonymous, which I thought was really interesting because some of you might even look at her Twitter picture and you say, oh, that's a cartoon of what she looks like. And basically what she's saying in this not being anonymous piece is saying, you know, listen, everyone, I'm not anonymous. And this line in particular stuck out for me as 
a, a takeaway. She says, quote, as one of the first full-time food critics of the millennial generation, I'm at the forefront of questions that the industry will have to consider eventually. I've been on the internet and posted all kinds of goofy stuff on websites since I was 15 years old. And as a millennial who graduated from college during the recession, I've had to diversify my career path with multiple creative projects or monetize hobbies and use my personal brand to get work and gain a foothold in my field. Being relatable on the internet is an important currency for my generation. After all, whether you're doing a job like mine or trying to crowdfund money from your, from your acquaintances, either way, if no one knows who you are, you'll have a harder time paying your rent, end quote. And that's fascinating. And it's something that we also talked about um, in my interview with Micah. It's like one of my first questions I asked him. So, And we talked about this before with more and more people seeing the guise of anonymity weighing less and less on the new scale of how media opportunities are growing. I think this is just another incredibly smart push of transparency on her part to make sure that she can remain credible, she can continue to do her job, and she can not get caught up in the riffraff of, holy shit, they know who I am. Now this is going to stress me out and now I, I can't taste as well or whatever. Um, for anyone wondering why critics would remain anonymous, um, for anybody who is coming up and they're like, why would anyone not want to say who they are? She gives this really great line in the article, quote, those minor precautions prevent the restaurant from over-preparing for my visits. Most kitchens can't drastically alter the food they deliver to me when they don't know that I'm coming, though they can toss a bunch of gratis shaved truffle on top of whatever random thing they hope to impress me with. Quote, pro tip, it's really obvious and that doesn't work. Truffles won't keep me from noticing other tables complaining that their salads took 45 minutes to arrive, end quote. And if this sounds like a lot about one food critic, please don't stress. I've got a ton of her other stories linked up below. It's actually in one link. As I said, it populates the entire uh, San Francisco Chronicles page. So you can go ahead and read whichever ones interest you. But she also has uh, two that I want to comment on, one about Chez Panisse and one about Thomas Keller's La Calenda, which we've covered here on the show a few weeks ago. Um, where, contrastingly, her experience was a little lackluster at Chez Panisse, she was pleasantly surprised with her meal at Kalenda. And after reading through both pieces, it's very refreshing how she's able to articulate why certain things um, struck her the way that they struck her, and how she takes these things outside of the meal and kind of incorporates them as frames of reference to how she's thinking about um, the meal at a certain place. And... Um, she says, quote, the final verdict, when Thomas Keller, a white American chef, puts his name on a Mexican restaurant project, it is indeed an example of cultural appropriation. That is a fact. There, But here are questions that one has to ask in order to go deeper into the spirit of what appropriation actually means. Who is benefiting materially from this project? Keller and his very rich partners? Of course. But does some of that profit go towards investing in the talents of people who truly got skin in the game? Are the right people receiving credit for what we've experienced in this restaurant? From what I've seen so far, I believe the answer is yes, end quote. So again, a great example of like, yes, the meal was amazing and I thought my experience was uh, XYZ, but also... The question on everybody's mind with a lot of these restaurants is like, what do they stand for in certain regards? Or like, what about the scandal about XYZ, right? And she's not afraid to include some of that in her writing when she's talking about these places, which I think is is great. So in the Chez Panisse piece, Chez Panisse piece she says, quote, overall, the experience of dining at Chez Panisse is so comfortable, it's culinary philosophy absent of any sense of urgency. But how much change can we spark without a healthy and challenging dose of discomfort, end quote. And I know, I know, that was a lot to do about one person, but I was frankly super skeptical when she was brought on to be the critic of the San Francisco Chronicle, and I've been nothing but immensely impressed by the content that she's put out ever since I've gotten a chance to fully deep dive into her work. And her stance on 2019 on a lot of issues is very refreshing. Her un unapologetic inclusion of her personality in her writing is very encouraging. And quite frankly, I would have done the same thing to anyone. Um, Michael Bauer's career was so long and so prolific that I would have expected someone from the New York Times to kind of swoop in and take the spot, but they made an insanely good choice in putting her at the helm, and I really, really look forward to her very real, and I won't use the word authentic, reviews of her experiences going forward. Wink, ding. Um, I want to put a shout out here um, for people on Instagram. If you have questions and you want them answered as direct answer, please leave them, and I would be happy to answer those for you. 
So next up, we have to talk about the Nick Kakonis, Kat Cora, Alinea, Chicago fiasco that went down because it is a beast of a scenario. And even though it's at its core, it's it's pretty simple. Uh, if 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 uh, if I ran into you at a bar tonight and I had to tell you the gist of it, I would be able to do it pretty quickly. But if you've been living under a rock or you haven't checked Twitter over the last forty eight hours, here's basically the gist of what went down. So. Uh, March 2nd at around 5 p.m., that's when the in-person interaction happens. That's the night of the incident. But it starts back at the end of February. So Kat Cora's executive assistant had made arrangements for Kat and her wife to have dinner at Alinea. They were able to give her a table at what she thought was 5 p.m. on the 2nd of March, but it was actually 24 hours and 15 minutes before then on March 1st, a.k.a. they got the date screwed up. And now, this is from the Medium piece, that Nick Kakonis wrote, quote, Friday, March 1st evening, Kat Cora did not show for her booking. We reached out and offered to reschedule for Saturday at 9 p.m. in the salon. Veronica Van Sant, her assistant, confirmed this change and we refunded the difference, end quote. So picture this now. So executive assistant books the table. It's for March 1st. Kat Cora doesn't show up. Alinea reaches out, says, okay, she didn't show tonight. Would you like to rebook for Saturday? Executive assistant says, yes, that's totally fine. So they apologize. The assistant and Alinea have some back and forth about rescheduling. And here, to me, is the point where all the confusion happens because this all goes south now. So on March 2nd, quote, I called Veronica and we spoke about the following. I asked for confirmation to cancel and refund the booking. I stated that if Kat arrived at 5 p.m., we would not have a table for her. Veronica said something along the lines of, Well, I am worried they're going to show up because I tried calling and they won't answer. They are in Chicago and I am not. Grant knows her. Can't he just reach out and let her know? I responded that I certainly can ask Chef Ackett's. However, we do not have any contact information for Kat and I doubted Chef would be able to reach out. I also stated... And this is Nick talking. I also stated that it was her responsibility to inform Kat since she purchased the booking. She was huffy and said, okay, but they are friends. I asked her, I thanked her for her time, I reminded her I was canceling the booking and that she would let me know if we heard, if we heard from Kat. And basically in parentheses, he then says, if she can't, if her executive assistant can't reach Kat, how can Grant reach Kat? That's a very interesting point to add. So then, the following unfolds on Kat Cora's Instagram. This is after she shows up at Alinea. She gets denied a table. She says, like, uh, basically Alinea says, we're full. I'm sorry, we're fully committed. We don't have a table for you. And I'm going to scroll over to this piece so that I can read this fucking ridiculousness for you. So it says, in Chicago, one of my favorite cities, blah, 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 blah. Devin nonchalantly said that they made a mistake when we arrived even and there was no table for us, even though I had a confirmation email from them for the reservation. We understand that mistakes can be made, but at least show your face, come and apologize to your guests. Chef Grant was there per Devin and didn't even come out. My time, as everyone, is limited and only want to support good establishments. I would never do this in one of my restaurants. I would never do this to a guest, much less, much less a fellow chef. Food is about love. Never do this to a guest, much less a fellow chef. Oh, sorry, I read that again. Food is about love, passion, art, sharing, and making memories. Arrogant, disrespectful, but happy that I got to enjoy girl and the goat instead who welcomed us with open arms and without a reservation blah, blah 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 then she says chef grant you should take a lesson on this from your mentor and my friend hashtag charlie trotter rest in peace or even some of our other fine colleagues and then she fucking tags and sophie peak art smith thomas keller david chang curtis stone dominique Crenn, michael mina graham elliott rick bayless and jose andres what a psycho what a psycho i read that and i was like Whoa, this is crazy. So that unfolds on Kat Cora's Instagram. And it's a post that she's deleted since then. Like, you can't find this. Thank goodness Nick uh, has screenshots of it, and he put it in the Medium article. Um, but anyways, Nick then adds, quote, Miss Cora believed that she deserved a table at Alinean despite no showing on Friday, rebooking and canceling on Saturday, and then just showing up to quote-unquote support Grant per her Instagram post later in the evening. Our staff described her as one of the most difficult situations they have ever encountered. I realize this also drags us down into her litter box, cat pun there, but 
Such is the unfortunate state of social media these days. Ultimately, it's my job to stand up for our team who do their very best every day to uphold an incredibly high standard of service, often in difficult situations, end quote. Okay, so there are the facts. Feel free to pause this, read the full medium piece, and come back here before I give my opinion, even though I've already kind of given my opinion a little bit. Chances are you've already decided where you stand on this. There is no shortage of chefs and entrepreneurs and industry folks that have come out in support of Alinea and Nick in this situation. But the same goes for Kat. There's been a lot of people who come out in support of Kat Cora. The problem with it is most of the people that I've seen that support Kat on her non now deleted Instagram post, they did so after reading her post and her post only. Does that make sense? Like they read her little mini rant on Instagram and then they were like, oh my God, how could they do that to you kind of thing? Do you know what I mean? So they didn't get both sides of the story because she painted them in an incredibly harmful light and it's really shocking and unfortunate to see the support roll in for her without hearing both sides of the story, right? So I personally don't follow Kat. I still don't follow Kat. And so I was absolutely receiving a biased stream of information from retweets and replies from Nick on Twitter. That was like the primary um, direction of news that I was getting from this whole situation was from Nick's side. It seemed to me, though, like most people who got the full story landed in the camp that I'm in, which is basically like at a certain point, certain people reach certain levels of fame and entitlement and perceived status that hearing no is not part of their vernacular anymore. And it's a really, really jarring experience when it happens, right? I feel like no shortage of us have seen it happen. This seems to be a, an example of just that. And as one of you let me know when you suggested this story, it's the bouncer at the nightclub syndrome, right? Like, listen, girl slash guy, you might have 100 million followers on Instagram and you might have let everyone know that you're going to be here tonight, but we don't have space. It's like a fire code thing. Like, we can't let any more people in, right? Or... Um, there's a buyout tonight. It's a private event. We can't let you come into this club tonight, right? Or insert any reason why people get turned away, right? And it's part of the reason that you wanted to go to Alinea in the first place. It's exclusive. Not everybody can get in. It's one of the reasons why you're excited to go. And this never would have happened at Tony's Fish and Chips Bar. That was a totally made up restaurant, by the way. Tony, I'm sure your fish and chips are bomb, but you get the point, right? Like she would have not done this at a Denny's. If Denny's was fully packed, she would not call out Denny's on Instagram. I really did my best here to think about being devil's advocate too. Like how frustrating must it have been for Kat Cora to have given this task to her executive assistant only to see things happen this way, right? How much does it suck if you promised your wife an amazing meal at Alinea and then all of a sudden it falls flat, right? And I can't, I, I, I can't seem to come up with a way where she's right in this scenario, which is a little bit frustrating. But this is the Emulsion Podcast. Your opinion matters just as much. So if there is a any sort of reality where you consider that Kat Cora is correct and that she was in the right, I would really, really appreciate your um, thoughts down below because from hearing both sides of the story here and actually seeing her, like if she was that proud of how she behaved, she would probably leave that Instagram post up. Does that make sense? So sharing a little personal story here. Um, I had an experience a few years ago where a friend of mine that used to work at Kitchen Table in London got my dad and I a table, or so we thought. And so what ended up happening was we showed up only to realize that an email got lost in the ether where we were supposed to prepay for our reservation, and that email never got sent to me, which is really unfortunate. So my dad and I, we take a cab across London. We think we're going to Kitchen Table for dinner. We show up for a reservation, and they're like, sorry, we sold your seats to someone else because you didn't pay. And I didn't blow up. I didn't assault the staff. I didn't even get mad that my buddy that forgot to forward the email forgot to forward the email. I just said, thank you, maybe next time. And we had a really great meal at Ali Dubu's place just down the street. So... I don't know. That's like, I, I don't have a story where I f have ever felt that way. Like I, I, I got shorted and maybe that's like, that would be a goal of mine in being so public with all the stuff that I do is that like so many of you know exactly, uh, who I am as a person. And that's kind of like, I would be really upset if there, there was ever a, a point where I got so upset where I would feel like I was getting shorted or that I was so, I deserved a spot at something. Um, I don't know. I hope I never get that way. I hope none, none of you ever get that way. And I think that this is like just a really 
glaring example of of the other side and egos are rough man like this just seems to be a case of egos at play no one deserves to be screamed at because you're having a tantrum because you didn't get what you wanted right and I, I also think it's a great example of choosing the high road right can you imagine if Alinea saw Kat Cora blow up and they got nervous about what the ramifications were on Instagram and they gave up someone else's table to make sure that Kat Cora got a spot just so that they wouldn't get called out on Instagram and then all of a sudden, Joe and Jamie from Chicago, who have been saving up for months to eat at Alinea, don't have a table because they had to seat the Iron Chef at 5 p.m. Like, can you imagine? Dude, that would have been incredibly harmful for the restaurant. And it's way easier for me to sit here and analyze all the potential ways that this could have gone. But I'm just happy to see it play out in an honest way, right? But the, the bigger question of the day here, where do you stand on this? Where do you think that this situation like do you think that it's right do you think that it's wrong I'm genuinely curious like do you do you agree do you disagree have you had an experience like this please let me know in the comments or tweet at me I think this is another incredible example of Nick killing it on the internet taking the time to write this piece to kind of get ahead of it and state the facts of this is exactly what happened being the PR guru that he is he's just he, he he's consistently doing great things for the restaurant and making sure that the brand always stays true to what it stands for which is great hospitality so man if you would have pitched this to me as a fake headline at the start of 2019 I probably would have chuckled at it but looky here it really really happened so there's that. John, J jo Joe and Jamie, Joe and Jamie, yes, Joe and Jamie, wanting to uh, get the get the table at Alinea. Hey, so I know we said we're done with headlines, but there are two quickie stories that I want to draw your attention to here at the end. And one is all about the guys from Joe Beef, David and Fred, um, and it's all about how they stopped drinking and how it's changed their lives in and out of the restaurant. I know that it's been news for a while. Um, I think. I don't think they announced it. I think it just became more public knowledge when they were on Joe Rogan's podcast. Um, but the, the, this whole piece is all about how their lives have changed. It's from Bon Appetit, and it's 100% um, worth your time. Or maybe it's worth passing along to someone you know that's struggling with demons of their own. And it's all um, here's a quickie um, quote to kind of entice you. Quote, I started asking myself questions about alcoholism. Was I showing my, what was I showing my children by eating and drinking like a Viking in front of them at the cottage? I wasn't acting on many opportunities because I was hungover most of the time. I was medicating with food. I was medicating with alcohol. And finally, it just got to a point where I was just very unhappy. If Joe B. fades away into obscurity, so be it. If I die tomorrow, I've had a wonderful career. I thank all the wonderful people who came. I gave it my best. I gave everything to you, the public. Now I have to take care of myself end quote. Aw, take care of yourself. Just like Jack LaLanne says, you're the only you you've got. And last up here, a publication out of Australia it published a quick piece. It's actually kind of long, um, but it's really interesting. And it's, it's all about how Uber Eats is changing apartment design. And it's fascinating. So the, the, the gist of it is people are moving in and they're not using their kitchens. Like we have these apartments, but people aren't really that excited if we show them a really decked out kitchen. Like they're just as ex they're they're more excited about more bedroom uh, square footage or more living room space. And so with their takeaway from that whole process was kitchens don't have to be these central fixtures in a home anymore. They can be almost an accessory, right? Because so many people are ordering in for dinner using things like Uber Eats and. You know, things like uh, these other problems they're dealing with, like, oh, shit, now we have to worry about tens of cars that roll up at 8 p.m. every night to deliver dinner. How do we do that? And, you know, they're also asking themselves a the question, is this just a trend and we're accommodating this kind of flash in the pan for these apartments that we want to last for decades? Is this going to fizzle out and then people are going to all of a sudden want kitchens again? And it's a fascinating read, and you folks know how I'm really trying to keep a pulse on how the food delivery model integrates with food businesses. Uh, so this kind of flips the script to think about the architect's perspective, not the consumer. Yes, the consumer, but not the restaurants or the delivery companies, but it's talking about like the people who design the places where your food is ultimately going to. Does that make sense? So... Um, I also kind of realized that I haven't been um, taking questions for direct answers. So if, again, we had to restart the live stream because we went over. Um, so if anybody has questions that they want to um, leave for direct answer, please leave them here because we're live on Instagram right now. And so if anybody has questions, I would love to answer your questions for you. So um, let me just actually wait here for a second and scroll back through here. Sorry that um, Instagram Live has a thing where they um, they limit you at 60 seconds, uh, 60 minutes 
for your thing. Sorry, I keep flipping the camera, guys. I'm so sorry. Does anybody have any questions? Questions that I can help answer? How, hello to everybody joining. Hello, hello, hello. Um, for everybody that's joining late, the reason that I'm not taking some of the questions that I have already is because I put out a thing on Instagram today about um, Ask JK, which is my YouTube uh, question show. And I'm trying to uh, not spoil any of those questions here. But I also don't want to... I do think she handled it poorly. Yes, that's very true. Sad, sad, sad. Okay, well, you know what? We're going to move on to this non-industry story. If anybody thinks of a question, please let me know. Um, this not this week's non-industry story has to be me getting engaged, right? I proposed to Anna while we were in Hawaii. She said, yes, you folks have been amazing on Instagram and Facebook showing some love. It really, really means the world. We are super happy. I know it's not something that I share that much on the channel or anywhere on the internet, really. I mean, like, I'll share when I'm with Anna and when we're doing cool stuff. Um, but I don't really share that much of our relationship relationship on the internet and that's by design. I don't really want our relationship to be used to gain followers or get sponsorships or even serve as entertainment for people. I think our relationship should be our relationship and nothing like exclusively that. Um, so this kind of is like a life milestone for me and I think that should be uh, newsworthy. So I thought I would share that and give a little shout out here on the show. Um, but where this does become industry focused, though, I decided that I wanted to have Anna on the podcast because we went through this really rocky period in our relationship where I was working in kitchens and she was in university and we were long distance for a while and she doesn't cook, but I cook. And there's a bunch of like topics that we um, we resonate on together, and we've clearly been successful at it because we're happy and we're engaged now. So I've decided to have her as a guest on the podcast. So that will be fun. You guys will get to ask your, you know, what's it like today to chef questions that you might have and also talk about a topic that I don't get often, which is dating outside of the industry. I have very strong opinions on that, and I haven't really shared them that much um, because there hasn't been that much of an opportunity to do so. So I'm looking forward to um, having her on the podcast and putting a mic in her hand and then seeing what, what happens from having my fiancé on the on the podcast. So we're going to record that this weekend, so stay tuned for that. I will put a, a post on Instagram um, that uh, where I can take questions from people, um, so stay tuned for that. That will be on Twitter as well. So that's going to do it for this episode, episode 92 of the podcast. Shout out to you for listening. It is great to be back. Stay tuned for changes on Patreon coming very, very soon. It might have actually already happened since I recorded this, so check that out if you want to support the show. There are tons and tons and tons of videos coming out at you very, very soon. Very, very much so love to you all. Please roll the outro. We did it. You're in outro land now. Thank you so much. I appreciate your ears more than you'll ever know. Hey, by making it to the end, you're the type of person that I want to speak to directly. This little production is constantly growing. If you enjoyed this episode, if you like what I'm trying to do with this show and want to make sure more people can find us, a free way to help out that takes less than three minutes is to leave The Emulsion a great review on iTunes. If you didn't enjoy this show, please also leave a review. I'm happy to take any constructive feedback you've got. If you want to learn more about supporting this show with your hard-earned cash, patreon.com slash justinkana is the place to do that. I've got tiers starting at just $1 per month. Let's say you just like being involved through suggesting stories to be covered or asking questions to my interview guests. You can stay up to date by following along on Twitter or Instagram that is linked up in the description for your convenience or always available on justincona.com. If you're on YouTube and listening, you can take this show on the go because this is available on all podcast platforms, including Spotify. And if you prefer video versions of things like my interview shows or the shorter intermezzo episodes and you're listening audio only, please check out my YouTube channel to see more of that. Now's normal normally where I'd say my name is Justin Kana and I hope you have a good one but you've probably got another podcast episode to listen to so I'm just going to get out of the out of the way here excuse, excuse me pardon me <laughs>